This is Tax Pro Nation, the home of independent tax professionals. Find community, maximize your earnings, and live life on your own terms. I'm your host, Jeff Dolan, Vice President of Pronto Tax School. And I'm your co-host, Andy Fry, founder and CEO of Pronto Tax School. My grandfather started Pronto Income Tax in Los Angeles back in 1965. My father and I carried on the family business and became tax business entrepreneurs. I launched Pronto Tax School because I know that given the right training and tools, you too can experience the freedom the tax business can offer. I grew up with a dad who wasn't working all the time, who had time to spend with his five children, who could take us to the beach on a Tuesday if that's what he wanted to do. The tax business can be an ideal business for people who want that kind of freedom, but it's got to be done purposefully in order to work that way. And that's why we're here, to help you navigate your journey as an independent tax professional. Don't do it alone. Join the nation. Let's jump in. Welcome to episode nine, where we will be discussing step nine of the nine steps of the Pronto Path which is our map of the journey you will take as an independent tax pro. In this opening series, we are tackling one step per episode. Step nine is called Fruition, Leave a Legacy. The big one. Good morning, Andy. That is a big one. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Can't believe it's episode nine. This is starting to feel like um, like a Star Wars thing or something or there's just you know episode nine if we can make as much money as they're making off those movies we'll be in good shape hey yeah that sounds good (laughs) well uh i noticed you don't have your coffee this morning no i already had a couple cups of coffee we're getting started a little later than usual uh today um but very excited to talk about this step in the path fruition and uh, and leaving a legacy i think that's something that is a lot a lot of independent tax professionals and minds right now and I think it's a huge topic in our industry. So I'm um, just uh, excited to talk about that and, and try to bring as much um, value to, to you guys as listeners as we can. Um, because sooner or later, we all get to this point in our career, um, in our business. And so uh, it's something that everybody's going to face and uh, you know, excited to, to share some information on it. Absolutely. So I know we talked about this analogy. Some people love analogies. Some people hate them. <laughs> <laughs> but the question was posed at this step. Are you growing a sequoia or a sunflower? Or, or what level of tree are you growing? <laughs> so if your career were a tree, what are you trying to grow? And, and so if you want to grow the sequoia, this episode is really going to help you think about it uh, in a way that helps you get, get to that point. And, and if it's something less than that or something smaller, um, that's okay too. But I think these, these things will still help you. So, so let's jump in. What are some aspects of the tax business that make fruition, you know, this step easier? So I think there's a few main aspects that make it so that if you want to um, if you want to grow a sequoia of a business, and I think what, what you were getting at by that analogy is, you know, sequoia is something that is a tree that can last for, uh, I believe, hundreds of years, right? I think so. Um, yeah. I, I don't, science was not my strong <laughs> suit, but um, and it, whereas a sunflower is a seasonal thing that, you know, grows, is beautiful for a time, doesn't have maybe that staying power. So I think the, um, I think you make a good point to say, like whatever your business looks like and whatever your career looks like, it's not a judgment thing that you have right. to have That's XYZ. Right. But it is something that if you want to grow your business to a point where it does last beyond you, mm-hmm. this episode's going to give you some great tips on how to how to do that and how to give yourself the best chance uh, to have that. And I think we're in a good position as um, uh, tax professionals, Jeff, in the sense that we have a chance to leave that legacy, to have that fruition stage, partially because the aspects of our business make that very possible. And there's a few key reasons that I wanted to mention. I think a lot of people that are listening will you know, will relate to this. Is First of all, it's a sticky type of business in terms of it's so relationship-based. Mm-hmm. So you have... Um, uh, an inertia that's positive for you as a tax business owner, the inertia of the client not wanting to change where they're going. You know, so if I can stay with where I am, 
that is going to be easier for me. You know, you guys already have all my records. You, you know me. You know, hopefully, you're treating me in a way that I enjoy. And, and, and probably the business is so competitive now that in order to have kept me for, say, 10 years as a client, I'm going to probably try to stick with you if I can, you know, if it makes sense. So that we have that kind of in our favor. Um, the second thing, which is you know, definitely in our favor, is that it's a mandatory business. People have to file their tax returns and right. they have to deal with the taxing authorities. Mm -hmm. It's not an optional thing. It's not like, you know, if the economy is down, then I'm not going to do my taxes, you know, or I'm not going to have to worry about taxes. You don't need a sweater for pinky. <laughs> yeah. a sweater for pinky type of business, it might be more of a sunflower situation, you know, with all due respect to pinky. So I don't even know what that even means, but that's kind of awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. Although that could be a good uh, not tax season business that could be complimentary. <laughs> Who knows? What, guys... st what step was that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What step was that? Stabilization. Yeah. That was that was in my other program. Go listen uh, to that episode. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, um, and then thirdly, it's a high profit margin business when you're doing it correctly. So tax professionals will see uh, profit margins, you know, forty percent, thirty percent, fifty percent depending how much of the work the owner is doing, how much of the billing and, and revenue the owner is generating, you have enough profit margin there that when you go to leave that to somebody else, I hate to say there's a, like a margin for error, but like when you're in a business where there's only 5% or 10% profit margin, if your costs go up by XYZ because you're a supplier or whatever else, but our type of business is it's, it's relatively low overhead especially if um, the person working in the business is generating revenue. And so um, there, there's a profit margin there in order to leave that to somebody else um, and have something to, to work with as far as numbers. Um, and on that same point is I would say it, it's a very easy entrance into the business for new people. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to have... Um, if you're going to have your business transition to somebody else... That person doesn't need to have you know, 12 years of schooling and all these credentials and everything that narrows down the pool of people that can do that. It's going to be um, pretty widely available to you know, any of your key employees or even your son or your daughter that hasn't been in the business at all before. You know, if they just go to our initiation uh, you know, phase of the Pronto Path, they're going to pretty easily be able to initiate. And so I think it, it allows for um, a, a wide selection of people who might be able to uh, take over the business when it's that legacy stage. Yeah, those, those are good. Those are good points. I like the mandatory part. You know, that's hard to find, right, in a business, uh, especially when the economy is really good, really, you know, doing well. The tendency is to get into a bunch of businesses that are nice to haves instead of need to haves. Uh, and so this is kind of, I don't want to say recession proof business, but it's, it does really well, right? During up or down times. It's been extremely steady. You know, I mean, it, it's one of those businesses where it's very interesting in the sense that your cash flow and your revenue throughout the year will really vary. But for some reason, like at the end of the year, you kind of tend to look and say, okay, it went up by five or 10%. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it kind of... That, that's why a lot of people, they can't take this type of business because they can't take the fact that like, hey, for a month, I might have ran negative cash flow, right? Like in August or whatever. And so, um, some people that's going to really generate a nerve wracking experience. Whereas, but if you look at the numbers overall on the business and on the industry, it's really been one of the most recession proof businesses, especially as a low cost business. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're we're helping people start tax businesses for, I mean, we're talking about less than two grand. Wow. I mean, that's not very much. And even a lot of people think like, hey, that's a lot or whatever. But look around at other businesses. Like people drop 50, 60,000, know, 100,000, 300,000 into a new business. So uh, when you think, hey, this is a steady uh, business that has a, it's a need, it's not a want. And, um, you know, then, yeah, it has over the past, uh, you know, 50 years, it's been a pretty steady and recession proof business. And then talking about profit margins, what are some of the, I mean, you, you mentioned a pretty wide range there. Uh, and I know it depends on in a service business based on how skilled you are and how well you, you know, can sell and all of that. But 
what what have you seen on the high end of the range? Because uh, I've I've heard you know profit margins pretty high in di- in different industries. Uh, what are on the high end? What are some of the the well run businesses seeing? You know, I think forty uh, percent profit margin after you've paid the owner's salary is a very good margin. Okay, you know, so you'll see a lot of businesses with twenty five percent margin or 20% margin after you pay the owner. And so that's why we talked in the last episode about um, the metric of shareholder discretionary earnings. So that essentially attempts to get at how much money does the owner or the shareholders actually get out of this business? Because um, with the different business structures that are used in a service business, right, you have the labor element of like the owners doing XYZ amount of work. And so they get this salary for that. And then you have the profit element. So between those two, like if you're going to leave your business to someone else, they, um, they want to know what that overall number looks like. And so that might be more like 60 or 70%. Gotcha. But you have to, you have to account for the work that the owner is doing in some way. Sure. Okay. Um, no, I wanted to call that out there. That's important. Yeah. Are you somewhere in your tax career and feeling lost with what to do next? Do you sometimes wish you had a map to show you your next step to reach your full potential as a tax professional? Here at Pronto Tax School, we have developed that guide. We call it the Pronto Path, and we want to share it with you for free. Go to taxpronation.com slash path right now. And then, so we talked about what makes this step uh, easier when you when you look at you know legacy and and why why even get into this business, why build your Sequoia using this vehicle, right? What are some of the you know more difficult aspects of this to keep in mind? Yeah, because there there are uh, some challenges. Obviously, anything that is worth doing, and especially in such a competitive economy like like ours, is always going to have some reasons why not everybody does that, right? And so, the challenge is that when you come to uh, leave a legacy in in your tax business, mainly come about. I feel like from the same things that make it possible to do that, if that makes sense. And 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 a lot of that goes to those relationships because you have such a relationship based business that if you as the owner are doing a very high percentage of that client work and say nobody else in your office really has those real relationships with those clients and the clients really are coming to you personally then it really becomes tough to to kind of transfer that trust to somebody else. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's why we, you know, like you said, we ended up kind of delving um, pretty deeply into these type of, uh, you know, selling your business or leaving your business topics in the transformed episode, which is last episode, because that's when you start thinking about those things. You know, that like, say, if I wasn't here, you know, for next week, what would, how much would we bill? that week versus if I was here. Mm, yeah. You, you kind of need to know that because when you're not there, somebody's going to say, look at the numbers and say like, okay, well, if we took you out of this equation, what kind of numbers is this business going to do? And so the client relationships and also, Jeff, the, the teammate relationships. If you have two or three key employees that you've been with for 10 years, if they stayed with you, tax season in, tax season out, tax season in, in, and just tax work in general can get kind of stressful. So a lot of people will, they'll fall out or they won't be. Up. So if they're with you for 10 years, it expresses like, we like something about what you're doing. And we probably like you and working with you. We may not like the next owner. That's a good point. That comes along. Yeah. So that's another thing that's a relationship-based thing. Um, and and so that would be something to, to look at. Um, I also think that there can be an issue with a lack of qualified buyers where there are certain buyers that they want to buy a business that they don't have to be there like at all or be involved at all. And I think the tax business, the franchises, I think can achieve some of that. But even those, if you look at the franchisees, 
they're usually pretty involved in the business, especially in the early years. And so somebody that just wants like a pure like cash flow business that they quote unquote don't have to do anything, um, you may realize as you're going through talking to that person that they don't really have a realistic expectation of what um, you know what they're going to need to do to be successful in that business. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, if if you were to sell to a franchise and you were the owner operator and they wanted to just buy it to not have to run it, you, they would almost have to put an operator in place to replace you, right? Is that what they do? Yeah, that's exactly what what would happen is, you know, if somebody owns say 20 uh, franchised offices, they exactly have a manager, an operator in each office. And that's why that shareholder discretionary earnings number, because that's how the manager's salary would be paid. So you would look and see like how much money is coming out of this business. Oh, and the owner's managing it. So they have to get paid something to manage it. Could I pay that same amount to someone else? And they do it at a similar skill level. But again, it's such a relationship-based thing that when the owner is there in the office... It's just something about it. There's an energy. There's a pride. There's a you know a go the extra mile thing that it's hard to replicate that in right. a manager. It is, yeah. So so we're talking about this legacy step. Do you have? I, I guess one of the key questions is: Do you have an exit strategy? Do you have a succession plan? Uh, obviously, like we talked about last week, you're not going to have unlimited energy. <laughs> You're not going to have unlimited desire to work into your 90s or you know beyond, right? So at some point, you're going to say, what does my legacy look like? How have I treated people? How have I treated my employees, my clients? What are those relationships? How do I want to make my transition uh, happen in such a way that everyone benefits and I feel good about it, Right. So, so, so two of the two of the options here, and we're going to talk about several. But you know, what is what is my exit strategy? What is my succession plan? So let's talk about that. So options. The first one, obviously, is selling your business. Let's talk about that. So I think it, it was interesting when we were preparing for um, this episode podcast. I looked up uh, on the old dictionary dot com. What does legacy mean? And it was interesting because the actual definition, the first definition that was given was essentially a property, a property or money that's left in your will. Like that's the number one definition. Interesting. And we have this kind of, you know, idealistic vision of, of legacy of that, you know, it's like they left a legacy of excellence or, or that kind of thing. But that was the, se- the secondary definition was something from the past that lives on in the future. Mm. So I think that when we get too idealistic about like legacy, like my legacy is that, you know, Johnny's going to have this business that is going to be the greatest thing for his family. And that's kind of like, I'm always going to be remembered fondly. I think a lot of our listeners, because we're so kind of, <laughs> we're a little bit skeptical at times, like maybe it's easier for us to digest like the legacy is money or property that you're leaving to somebody and in the form of your business and wanting to make sure that that's the maximum value that it can be not only now but into the future and then secondarily too leaving something from the past that lives into the future i think that's the ideal idealistic part which again i love i think that's great um of what you're saying is what from my work and my life's work is going to carry forward? And I think that's all tied into this stage. So I did want to just... Because I was surprised when I saw that. I wasn't really thinking of the word legacy meaning that. But then when I saw that, I was like, oh, that's actually kind of a cool way to look at it. Yeah, no, I like that. That's it's really all good. about the cash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so depending on whether you're on that side or the idealistic side, hopefully this this will be right up your alley. So. But I think it's interesting because you come to the first exit strategy that pops into people's mind. The first one you mentioned is selling your business, you know, cashing out. Which is typically selling to a franchise, right? I think it's hard to say typically, but that's definitely one of the options that almost everyone considers. Because the the franchises, the bigger companies that have that operational 
experience to make that transition of the client base. They're so experienced in doing that and they've done it so many times that I'd say it's always an option. Is that how is that looked at in the tax industry, tax pro industry? I'm I'm kind of outsider looking in. Is that the equivalent of selling out or is that like favorably looked upon? Like how how does that uh how is that that viewed? I think it's viewed in again thinking of our audience is that we're generally pretty pragmatic. So how we view it is going to depend probably on the deal that we get. Gotcha. So it's based on, you know, did you did you make some money on that or was that it, it, there's no real feelings attached to it. I think there are some feelings attached to it. I think that those feelings are sometimes take a secondary definition, if you will, just like I talked about the definition of legacy to am I getting the best deal that I can? Because when you're a tax professional and you've built up this business and you've gone through all these steps that we've talked about and stuff, you you already feel good about you left everything on the field. You know, like you did the absolute best you could for your clients. And now it's time for you to to move on. So I think that most tax professionals they're pretty you know they're they're pretty pragmatic about that step. There are emotions involved, obviously, but I think that people feel like I always gave my best to my clients. And I think if we look as independent tax professionals, like what's our competitive advantage? I think it's that. You know, I think it's that most independent tax professionals that I know, they're really taking pride in doing what's best for their clients right. from wherever they are. And so I think when you feel like that and you feel like you always always did that you feel at this stage of fruition that it's time for me to uh, you know to to get what's coming to me and so when you go to sell your business you will look at it from a pragmatic numbers perspective there will be emotions but also when you look at having your office rebranded you're going to in a way trust potentially more so H&R Block to take over your office because you know that they have trust. Like they have earned trust for me and in business so long. It may not be everybody's favorite like solution. And I know a lot of people, a lot of independent tax professionals like to, you know, like to um disparage. Yeah, throw shade or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> well, that's what I'm asking, right? Like, is that like, you know, seeding to the enemy or something? If you're if you're competing with a big box in your town and they're giving you an offer letter every year to take over your independent business. <laughs> do you have some sort of, you know, feeling there where you're like, oh, I'm going to try to do, if I'm going to sell my business, it's going to be to another independent tax pro that I trust rather than big box retailer kind of. Yeah. If you have that option, the thing is, is that how many independent tax pros are actually qualified and have the systems and have gone through all the steps that we've talked about to be that trusted buyer. There's uh-huh. not that many. Well, if you are one of those and you're listening, email us at hello at taxpronation.com because we want to find you. We want to connect you with the right people. Yeah, I think that's going to be a big opportunity area for our members that are interested in growing their business further. You know, you can go start an office from zero and build up a client base. But if you already have two, three locations and you see all these people that want to exit the business, why go and start from zero? You know, why not connect with another independent tax professional that wants to exit the business? So we'll certainly be working on some programs uh, to make those connections. And um, I did want to reiterate when you go to if you go to sell your business, there are going to be certain deal points that you need to know about ahead of time that will probably come up. And number one would be you need to actually transition your clients. Like you need to actively work in the business to transition your clients to that new owner. Generally speaking, you don't just like head out into the sunset. <laughs> they they want you to personally help them transition those clients to a new owner and make those introductions and all that. So that may entail working for one or two tax seasons uh, with the new owner. Which if you're if that's a non-starter for you, you wanted to kind of know that ahead of time. That's probably going to be a deal point. Uh, the second deal point that for some people is a non-starter is usually the purchase agreements have what's called a clawback provision, which is based on client retention. So you would have a purchase price. And then if the clients are not retained or the revenue is not 
maintained at the same level that the purchase price, the the that the purchase price kind of assumed, let's say, the purchase price will adjust downward. So you'd have like a five-year payment plan. And if the first year your clients drop off by 30%, your purchase price may drop off by 30%. Wow. Yeah. Um, so that's something to also keep in mind. And then in terms of generally pricing of tax businesses, we see between 1 and 1. 1.5 times the gross revenue of the business as kind of a rule of thumb. That being said, I would say that the rule of thumb is very... It can, it can really be different for different situations. Yeah. And that, that multiple strikes me as low pretty low, right? Because I come from the software as a service industry where you have very high multiples. But we're not talking multiples on profit, right? We're talking multiples on gross revenue. Yeah. And that's how it's been kind of the rule of thumb in, in our industry is based on gross revenue. Part of why that has been more of a metric is because a company that would buy another tax company they kind of acquire the business in a way to put it together with their existing business. So they already have like a certain level of admin staff, let's say, right? And they can kind of like glom on a new client base without adopting a huge amount of new fixed expenses, if that makes sense. Right. So they kind of look for the revenue itself. Mm -hmm. And also they look for businesses that are underpricing their service so that they can increase revenues simply by raising prices. Right. That makes sense. So raising price by 30%, you lose 15% of your clients, you're still out by 15%. Right. So they're coming in doing the uh, the elevation step. <laughs> yeah, they're they're doing the elevation. If you skipped over that step, <laughs> you know, that they would want to uh, to negotiate the agreement in a way that reflects the fact that you skipped over doing that. Right. And then also go ahead and do that for you when <laughs> the time is right. So if you didn't like doing it yourself, someone else will do it in the legacy step if you're going to sell your business. <laughs> no, that's really interesting. Yeah, and I think a lot of people have to uh, take these things into mind as they as they decide what option they want to take, right? Because I think, you know, you you had mentioned getting offers from big box retailer type tax preparation businesses, right? Over yeah, the years? absolutely. And that, that's something that's an annual tradition <laughs> right. to, to, to get the land. It's very complimentary. You know, it's something where, uh, hey, at least uh, we're on the radar and, you know, we're in the game and, you know, people perceive that we're doing a good enough job for clients and taking care of them to where our business has has value. And, um, but, but same thing though, if when you already know what kind of the clauses of that agreement are going to be, mm -hmm. you're more able to say like, yeah, you know, not really wanting to do that right now. But like I said, when people come to sell their tax business, I would say, you know, nine times out of 10, that's always going to be a consideration is to sell to, to a franchise that um, they already know what to do. They've done it before. They have a system for doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I could see where that would be attractive. Why wait to, why wait until this step and not an earlier step to, to sell your business? Uh huh. I think because of the last step that we talked about, about having a transformed business, you are going to get such a higher price and have so much leverage when you go to sell your business when that business has value aside from you even being there. Because just think about it logically as a buyer of the business, you're not going to be there, right? Right. Or if you are, maybe you are going to stay on as an employee. I mean, there's all different arrangements that can come up. But when you have transformed your business to be able to generate profit and be successful without you being there, then you're in a position to sell other than just for a bad reason of like, I want to just get out of this. So I think too, for this fruition step, like a lot of times this is when the person's, when the tax professional is coming to retire, but not necessarily. Yeah, I was going to say, what if, what if I'm a tax professional that... I don't have as much energy and drive as I used to have, but I still love the business and I still love the client relationships. And I, you know, actually your your second point there about the clawback provisions, I actually like that. I actually want to extend that. I, I want to be kind of the the wise sage walking around the office, right? That everybody looks to, but I'm not actually doing the work. I'm just guiding other people. I'm kind of the guru there. Uh, and I get paid, but you know what I'm saying? I'm not 
holding the ton- the uh, all the client load that I used to. Yeah, and all the risk, you know, and all the paying all the insurances and doing all the HR. And I think that's why when you come to this step of your business, where you're looking at you know succession plans and and sort of what's next for me to take out some of the judgment that we have sometimes about that like maybe it's just a different season of life for you mm-hmm. maybe you're ready to do something else that you wanted to do and i think that's something where because the clients view it so much as like you're my you're my tax guy you're my tax lady that we absorb that as if it's like we have to do that for our lifetime. Like I know for me, when I stopped doing taxes full time, people were literally freaking out. Like it was like, <laughs> what? Like, no, you can't do that. And it's like, you know, actually, I can do that. And that's what I'm already doing. And so the good th- part about it is that you have a great option right here too. And you're going to have a relationship with this person who's a really cool person in their own way. And so sometimes when I go back and I, I, the jo- clients joke with me because they'll see me and I'll be like, you know, I, I actually like Cynthia better than you anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so, but just, just stepping out of the box and being like, look, we have earned it when you get to this point and you, and you know that you did the best you could for every client as, as much as you could. You feel good about whatever the next step is going to be. Um, and I think taking the judgment out of it would be good. Being open to unconventional relationships, uh, un- unconventional solutions such as, hey, these people are better at running a tax business than I am, but I still like to have that wise sage position. And I'd still like to have a salary of 40000 and help manage or help do the training or whatever it is that you really like to do in the business. There's a lot of buyers that you know can see value in that because there is value in that. Right. Yeah. Some of those other options might be you know, letting the employers take over and own the business. Yeah, the employees. Employees, I'm sorry. Yeah, and and that's uh, something that is a, again, would be a consideration. Like those first two, like selling to a bigger company, you know, they've done this before. Um, Or or having the employees or or one or two key employees take over the business, again, is going to always, not always, but generally be a consideration. There are definitely some challenges that can come along with that. But there's also some some opportunities because you know that they know what the culture is. They probably have a lot of those client relationships or at least the start of them because the clients will have met them before. Maybe they helped them out in some capacity over the years. You have a possibility there. Um, and and I've actually done, done that personally um, with one of our offices. And, and I would say overall, it's worked out pretty well. It is something though that you got to realize that Employees are employees, and business owner is a totally different ballgame. It's about that mindset we were talking I about. I mean, it's a tough mindset yeah. because you, you know, you're when you're an employee, and especially if you're a good leader of your office as a business owner, whatever isn't working, if it's not working and needs to get fixed, you're either going to make it happen yourself or you're going to find someone and cause it to be resolved. And the employee is the one that's saying, you know, I took it to this point and it's not working. So like things should be working in the office and here, like you take this, <laughs> fix this. So, so that's, a, I mean, how important in life are habits, right? We are what we repeatedly do. That's right. So not everybody can make that leap to being a business owner. Um, and, uh, and there's going to be some, <laughs> you know, there's going to be a learning curve there, just as we had a learning curve for that new person. So if you're transitioning it, do you have enough patience and empathy and understanding, but also accountability to help that person do that and make that leap? There can definitely be some risk there if you're counting on getting your full payment. Are you thinking about getting into the tax business, but not sure where to start? Maybe you're not even sure the tax business is the right fit for you. And you don't want to invest a lot of money or time quite yet. You just want to get a taste of tax knowledge and see if you like it. Or maybe you're an experienced tax pro and you see someone else in your world who needs an introduction to the tax business, but you don't have time to teach all the basics. If either of those situations sound familiar to you, you need to check out the Pronto Tax School Basic Income Tax Course today. It's fun, entertaining, and gets you a real IRS credential. Go to taxpronation.com slash basic to find out more. If you're just 
thinking about your succession planning at this step, right, then you you have to give it some time, right? This isn't something where you decide, okay, I'm going to sell my business and then you just wrap it up and sell it. Uh, you have to be planning ahead. And hopefully, if you're listening to this and you're at this step, you are uh, giving yourself some some runway there uh, where you can find the right people, you can put the plans in place, you can retain control and leverage in these conversations if you are selling it, uh, you are building a transformed business. You know, you're not just being hasty with it because if if you are hasty, your things are going to happen where you probably are not going to get the most fruit out of it. <laughs> Especially if you want to outright sell it. I mean, I remember one uh, business person told me one time that people only want to sell a business for bad reasons in terms of that don't benefit the buyer. Now, I don't think that's necessarily true you know but it was there was something about that where this he was a pretty savvy business person kind of on the skeptical side as you might say by, by hearing that quote but there's some truth to that in terms of like why do you want to sell like if this is going well and it's going to go well for me then why do you want to sell it mm-hmm. right so being clear about why do you want to sell it you know, okay, this is the next stage of your business and this is your retirement. Um, you know, you're ready to do something else. What does that look like? And then just being buttoned up on the numbers that tell that buyer, hey, if you were in that buyer's shoes, would you want to buy this business? And looking at it from their perspective, because obviously that's how they're going to look at it. Yeah, you had mentioned this before, um, you know, retiring to something rather than from something. And I think that's an important concept. Yeah, I think that's that's something where you know you were mentioning that a lot of people when they retire from their their company, you know, that they've built um, or their career or their job, I could see how depression would set in and you feel kind of aimless. Because uh, for me, like I love to work, you know, I think it's it, it's a lot of fun. Like it's actually fun, and if I wasn't able to to work, it would be tough. You know, like in a way, it's appealing, but just very much on the surface. It's kind of like when you have a full time job and you're like, it'd be so great if I didn't have to do anything. And then, like, the next day you get laid off. <laughs> <laughs> Always the next day. <laughs> or maybe not the next day, but the next month or whatever. And then you're like, oh, I actually don't have to do anything. I'm getting unemployment. And then, like, you're sitting there watching daytime TV and, you know, you're, you're actually, <laughs> next thing you know, you're depressed. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you're eating whole bags of Doritos. And <laughs> <laughs> not that that's ever happened to me, but, um, <laughs> but if you, if you, uh, if you are mentally looking for and spiritually and, and everything else looking forward to something, to do something, Right. Uh, when you're not doing your business full time, it seems like you know I haven't gotten there myself, but it seems like that would be a lot healthier situation. Well, sure. And and the folks that I've talked to that are at that age or retired, and they go through that phase, almost all of them say there's only so much golf you can play, only so much time you can have where you're just kind of retired before you have to engage again and and do something. Especially, I would say for for men. You wake up in the morning, you need that purpose. Uh, you need to have somebody that you're helping or, or, or giving back at this stage. And so I, I feel like, you know, if you're just retiring because, well, it's I'm 65 or whatever, right? I'm, I'm at the age where I'm supposed to do that. Well, we'll step back and ask yourself, you know, do you have the energy? Do you have the desire? Do you have something you're moving to? Is there a reason? Is there a new purpose in your life, right? I think it's a good time to assess and kind of see that coming and plan for it. And, and I know a lot of people plan ahead, especially, you know, tax pros. So this shouldn't be anything new, but uh, it's worth it's worth talking about. Yeah, and also it's, uh, it's something where when you're telling the person that's going to take over your business, either through purchasing it or if it's an employee or, you, you know, you're having someone else do it, When you tell that person, I'm moving on to do X, Y, Z, and I'm really looking forward to that, 
again, that's a great leverage point because it, it helps you understand that, hey, maybe they're not selling for a bad reason. Correct. They're just ready to do something else. They did this with their whole their whole heart while they were doing it. Yep. Um, and that's how I felt when I was kind of stepping back from the day-to-day. I was like, I'm really excited about what's going on with this tax training, the tax school that we got going. I really want to build this up and help this set of customers. Right. Right. And, yep. and so I still love everything about you know, um, help the clients that we helped then. And that was cool. And I I put myself really into that. And now I'm going to put myself really into this. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was talking to, 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 um, you know, different options of of kind of getting out of the day to day, that that made me feel good when I was able to say that, because I know that that's true. Right. And I know that, Hey, a new, this is a great opportunity for somebody to, you know, to, to be involved with. Absolutely. So, so as we are planning, and we are thinking about what practical actions that we can take at this step. What kind of uh, key professionals can I be networking with or building relationships with to help me at this stage? Because I know that, you know, obviously, if you're going to be looking at doing these major transactions with, you know, your business, you're going to need key people. And other than grooming your successor or whoever you're going to pass the business on to or finding a buyer? I mean, what, what, who are the people on your team that are new that we might not have had on previous steps? Yeah, and I think that's going to be part of that planning step, you know, where you are, hey, a couple years down the line, you're thinking about retiring. You're thinking about doing something different, whatever it might be. Or even if it's six months down the line, the point is to start developing some relationships now with the other teammates that will help you make this the best solution for you, um, for your career, for your business. And so I think that comes down to people like uh, a business attorney, uh, a business broker, you know, maybe somebody that already has a list of people that want to buy tax businesses. They know how to structure all of those type of clauses that we just talked about. You know, and and um, they know I mean, which buyers are going to insist on a uh, that the owner work there for one or two years versus the ones that that's not a, that important to them. They know that you know this buyer is looking for this type of business that's going to fit with their existing business, right? Same client group, whatever it might be. So I think a business broker um, and they can also ass- um, assess the seller in qualifying for a loan. Because they know the other loan officers, the, the the business bankers that know how to package those loans and able to um, to buy a tax business, definitely a uh, a good accountant or CPA to review your financials and make sure those are you know buttoned up, are ready to go, and are going to stand up to someone who is going to audit them essentially. And for a lot of tax business owners, that area need some preparation ahead of time, let's say. (laughs) Right. Um, And also uh, an estate planning attorney. Say you are leaving it, part of it to a family member through a trust, or you have some kind of estate planning considerations. You may want to have an estate planning attorney uh, look at how the business overall fits into your, uh, your overall estate plan for what you're leaving to your family. And that might be another team member that you would want to develop a relationship with as part of the preparation for transitioning uh, from your business to a new part of your life. I would also add, see if you can find a a mentor in this area that's actually sold a business before, ideally a tax business. Uh, I know they might be hard to find, but if you can at least find somebody that has bought and or sold a business, they can walk you through all the ups and downs and all the things to think about and kind of guide you through the process. And if your business is not yet packaged and ready to sell, they can guide you through that as well. And, you know, definitely listen to the last episode to kind of get all the different mindset things and and different uh, pieces you can put in place to make sure that you're ready to sell. Um, But I would just, I would recommend that as well. Yeah, I think that's a, a great point. And maybe those are some of the connections that we'll be able to make between our members to, sure. to facilitate a framework for being able to have uh, that mentoring happen. You know, hey, this person sold their business through this type of agreement, which worked out well for them. Maybe that's a good agreement framework for you to work off of. And and as independent tax professionals, I and mean, that's the fun part of trying to build up this community. 
there are a lot of underutilized assets and knowledge and things that are going around in our uh, community that we actually can start helping each other. And for this fruition stage of somebody's business, where this is literally somebody's life work a lot of times, this is such an important thing. It's such a great thing to be able to help somebody with. I mean, if we can be a part of making some of those connections, I know that would be a meaningful thing for us uh, as a company. Right. And you had mentioned even uh, some of the ideas of new courses to work on for the Pronto Tax School, having uh, a course about how to buy a tax business. And not only how to buy a tax business, Jeff, but what I found out is that it's actually very possible to buy a tax business with no money down. Oh, wow. (laughs) That's kind of crazy, right? (laughs) We actually have someone in our network who's done that over 10 times. And had that been a good thing, have that uh, be a good thing for the seller. So when you think of that, maybe you're thinking... Well, that's not giving the seller a fair deal, or that's not beneficial. But what this gentleman has been able to figure out is structure an agreement where it is a win-win. We need to get him on the show. Yeah, and it's it's going to be uh, that's something that's in develop right, uh, development. That's something that's in development right now is how to buy a tax business with zero dollars down in a way that actually benefits the seller too, because. There are going to be a lot of retirements, a lot of people exiting the business, but really over the next five years, just demographically, if you look at the baby boomer generation, 10,000 people retiring a day. Wow. Um, and, and so a lot of the best and most skilled independent tax professionals are between 60 and 100 uh, years young. <laughs> nice. Okay. So that. You know, what does that succession plan look like? And if you're looking for new opportunities in the tax business, how do you connect with those folks and have it be a mutually beneficial thing where you're respecting their legacy, you're helping uh, them leave that legacy, and you're also finding an opportunity for yourself? So I'm excited about uh, that part of our efforts is to make some of those connections. Yeah. So obviously, in this episode, if you're at this step, you might be looking to buy or sell your tax business. Uh, And since we have this unique platform to reach so many tax pros, we want to extend a helping hand to connect buyers and sellers. Uh, If you have this business need, please email us at hello at taxpronation.com. That's hello, H-E-L-L-O, at taxpronation.com. And we'll make sure you get the latest updates on this initiative as it develops. Tax pros have seen it coming for years. The entrepreneurial wave is here. And that means more opportunity to do corporation, S-corp, and LLC business tax returns. With the new tax law, they're even more complex and in demand. Professionals who increase their skill set in this area can expect to become more profitable and successful. Pronto Tax School has the perfect online training course for you called Business Tax Verified with CPA Adam Shea. Find out more at taxpronation.com slash business. So before we wrap up, I want to just talk about something that I think is really key at this step. The question was, what makes your business fruitionable? <laughs> fruition worthy. <laughs> fruition worthy. And uh, you know, we were kind of talking about the wise sage earlier and how once you move to this level uh, of experience in your business, you really become you know, like like the Warren Buffett, you know, the Oracle of Omaha, um, where your number one job is to communicate the vision for what your company is, where it's going, what it's going to be, and and how you communicate that, and if you communicate that clearly and, and consistently uh, to your to your business and to your your clients, and, and you're and you're you're sharing your culture, why you want to do that, because. When you're going to leave your legacy, what's what's hard is when you don't communicate that well and your successors are guessing at how to run the business. And it loses that thing that really made people draw to you and be attracted to you and want to trust you and do business with you. It loses something, right? And obviously, you, you not being there uh, is the major thing that it's going to miss. But... You, if you do it in such a way that you clearly communicate it, 
your successors will know how to carry on that spirit. And so the example I use is Warren Buffett because he has that shareholder letter every year that he writes. And he has that conference and everybody comes from all over the world and it's exciting. But you know, I think he does a very good job of communicating what his values are, what his principles are, how, why he and how he buys businesses and and you know he, I know he says he never wants to sell a business but you know sometimes he does and so all those principles will then when he does have a successor come and he names who that is and it, and it comes out maybe by the time this episode comes out <laughs> he'll have shared that but basically he does a very good job of that and so I would just encourage anyone at this step to Think about that. Think about how well you're communicating your vision and your values and your culture to your company. And I think it's interesting with communication because a lot of communication happens by what you do and the example that you set. But I think you make a great point in this stage of your business where you're looking to leave that legacy and legacy has to do with something from the past living into the future communication helps that happen. Yeah, because what happens... I mean, I think we talked about the statistics of failed businesses in the third and fourth generation. Uh, it's very high, right? Because the original founder doesn't do a good job of this. They don't, they don't pass on their legacy very well. And so by the third generation, they're so confused about why are we doing this again? What's the point? What's the purpose? What, what's so special again? <laughs> or they just don't have any interest in it, right? And so you're a third generation business owner in your, in your business. Can you explain why, why you have been successful and, and how, how did that uh, vision get to you? Well, I think it's something for, for us where it's funny that you mentioned the third generation is we're usually the ones that just completely tank everything into the ground. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it's funny because I, you know, I, I've researched and studied a lot of businesses and I used to be a business journalist and that kind of thing. So I know that. Like I know that that's what happens is when it gets down to the third generation, like we just start <laughs> doing things the wrong way and, and trying to you know, not do things the way that got us to be successful. And I was always very conscious of that. I was like, I want to make sure that we are not the ones that mess this up. And so it was definitely something that was on my mind. I think what's great about the way that my dad has led the company is that he's such a lead by example person that I don't feel that he has to say that much to get his point across. You know, and I'll give you an example that one time I was, uh, I got a text from one of my coworkers, and it was essentially a, just like a little phone video of my dad basically vacuuming up the office at the end of the day. And so that explained to me why that team member, they could be off doing whatever else, doing their own business. But that leadership aspect of it, of before you leave for the day, you want the office to look nice. So that the next person that comes in doesn't have to see a messy office or the clients are going to come in and it's not going to look right. Just that kind of setting that example, I think that that says people watch what you do. They do listen to what you say to some extent and it is important to communicate. Um, but uh, I think communicating by example is something that's, uh, that can't, my dad really, really did. And I'm more of the verbal communication. I like to tell people and sometimes overexpress what I'm trying to tell you. But for me, like what I discovered early on in the business that was the solid ground that I felt like I would always view myself as successful if I did this, even if I wasn't making a lot of money, is that I would know when we sit down with clients, we put their best interests first, period. So everybody that we're working with gets that. Awesome. Well, this has been great. This has been so much fun. Uh, I hope everyone listening has just enjoyed the ride, enjoyed the journey uh, through the Pronto Path, all nine steps. We're here at the end uh, of this kind of series. Uh, what's next for the podcast? We're about to get to the fun part of having other people talk <laughs> instead of just uh, me and Jeff, even though that's been fun too. I know it's been fun for us. Hopefully, it's been fun for you too. Yeah. And so that would be the two types of shows that you would expect is you would have 
kind of an expert or a teacher that had figured out, you know, this is how I got from this step to this step. And these were the key things that I did. And these were the obstacles that I encountered. And this is how I overcame them. Right. So something that we can really learn from. And then also we would have this is my story. This is what I'm going through. And hopefully we'll have some, some funny things and just some, uh, some, this is where we're at right now. And um, hey, I recognize either I used to be like that or maybe my next step will look like that and just kind of build up um, that community as independent tax professionals as indicated by the word independent. A lot of times we feel like we are out on that island. So a lot, the big point that we want to do with this show is to um, you know give you that camaraderie, um, you know walk with you down this path, and uh, you know enjoy the process. Absolutely. Well, that about wraps it up for the uh, nine steps of the Pronto Path. All of the show notes for this episode can be found at taxpronation.com/nine. We've actually created an infographic of the Pronto Path, so you can see all the steps in one place. Go ahead and download that at taxpronation.com slash nine as well. We hope this episode made your life a little bit easier and more profitable. Join us next week as we start our conversation with you, the listeners. We cannot wait. Don't miss it. Make sure you are tuned in on your favorite platform and take care. Take care.